the town bell rang, and for as far as it could be heard, young man and old pulled on their boots and headed for the village green. In the chill night, 130 militiamen stood at the ready for an hour. But it seemed the alarm might be false. Captain John Parker had sent scouts to locate the Redcoats, but not one had returned. Parker released the men to wait for the next call of the drum. Up to 30 withdrew to nearby Buckman Tavern. There's always a sort of a loaded situation when you're sitting in a tavern all night. I'm not sure at Buckman Tavern they felt the night of April 18th that they were uh, going to have a, a major war on their hands. I think they were intent on showing the British that they were serious. Out on the road, the regulars were being driven hard, a mile every 16 minutes. Their officers feared daybreak and detection. Inside some of the houses they passed, men and women were wide awake, melting pewter dishes into musket balls. Inside Buckman Tavern, all was quiet. At about 4.30, a scout returned with news. The Redcoats were indeed coming. They were less than half a mile down the road. Three British companies, about a hundred men, reached a crossroad. A hot-blooded young lieutenant had to choose between taking his men toward Concord, where he had been told to go, or into Lexington, where he could see armed Americans waiting. With his superiors out of earshot, Lieutenant Jesse Adair made his fateful choice. At five o'clock on the morning of April 19th, he led his men toward Lexington Green. Captain Parker gathered his men, now fewer than 80, and gave his orders. Stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. No one knew what would happen when the two forces collided, and certainly no colonial a uh, commander wanted to give the order to fire. If they fired on British regulars, they could be tried for treason. The militia heard British Major John Pitcairn yell, lay down your arms, and another officer shout, ye rebels disperse, damn you, disperse. Outnumbered, Captain Parker told his men to abandon the green. Then, from somewhere, a shot rang out. There is no saying who fired it, rebel or redcoat. But in that puff of smoke, the bond of kinship between England and America was severed. This is a revolutionary situation in which literally Everything changes, not merely in the course of a single day, but almost in the course of a single minute. Long as it takes to fire the guns and the soldiers drop dead, everything has changed. In the chaos, the British charged forward, blindly thrusting their bayonets and ignoring their officers' shouts to fall in. At last, the drums brought the Redcoats back into ranks, and their officers marched them the way they were supposed to have gone in the first place, toward Concord. The British took stock and found they had only one man wounded, a private shot in the thigh. For the families in Lexington, the toll was unthinkable. Eight men lay dead. Nine more were wounded. Among the survivors, shock gave way to rage. They shouldered their muskets and set off toward Concord to vent their grief in British blood. <laughs> 